said and I do believe that during the moment of death there is a thin veil between earth and heaven and if you're very sensitive and alert you might be able to get some special callings and that's what happened to me when my husband was dying he was only in his 40s and I had a two and a half year old so when the doctors told me he was terminal. I really just couldn't believe this would be happening to my life. So it was hard and we went through a lot of different treatments. Of course he wanted to live um, and we did just about everything we could and I tried to keep him at home as long as I could because he really liked the house and he liked to see my son our son running around. So, uh, But it became too difficult and he ended up going to the hospital and um, he was in the hospital and I don't know, part of me kept thinking he was gonna get better. I, I am not a medical person at all and I just kept thinking things would be better. And he would be there and I would go every morning, I would have one of the women in my neighborhood stay with Elliot. He was three and um, I would go into the hospital and I'd just sit with him and I would honestly thought he was maybe getting better. I don't know where my head was, I guess total denial. But anyways, um, that morning I went in and saw him and then I left. When I got home, I was doing housework and getting lunch ready for Elliot and I had really a very deep nudging on me that said, you need to go to the hospital. And I kept denying it and sort of fighting it and saying, no, I'm not going to the hospital again. I've been there this morning and he was okay. I'm not going. Well, the voice got louder and louder and it was really pushing me. No, you need to go to the hospital right now. So I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just see if this friend is still available to take care of Elliot and I'll go to the hospital again. So I called my friend Susan and I said, I know I had you in the morning, but I, I feel this calling that I need to go to the hospital. And she goes, wow, I didn't go into work today and I, I'll be right over. So Susan came over, I got in my car and I drove to the hospital and I went into the hospital room and Walter was there in bed, his eyes were closed. And I just went over to him and I put my arms around him and I was just recalling our trips we had and telling him that Elliot was now being able to ride on his bike and he didn't want his training wheels and he was trying to do wheelies and all this. And I was kind of laughing and pretty jolly about it. Well, all of a sudden I noticed that he was very still and I didn't hear any breathing and then I heard the flat line of the ventilator and I was very surprised. I was thinking what was happening and I was sort of in disbelief and the next thing that happened was a nurse came in. She was over my shoulder and she said, oh my, he's been waiting for you. And I said, oh, and she said, and then when you told him your happy memories and how well Elliot was doing on the bike, he realized that you were gonna be okay and he released himself and he went to heaven. Well, after that, it was all really a blur. I couldn't even remember where I parked my car. I had to call my parents up. I was really such a wreck, but I was able to move on and it's terrible. That was a terrible tragedy for my husband to be taken so young and when I had a little boy, but I am grateful for the way that that whole experience really made me click with my religion. It was the first time I thought, wow, the Holy Spirit is real and it got a hold of me even though I was very negative and saying no, the voice was so loud. 
So I am grateful that I now have hope and peace knowing that there is something out there, there is something bigger, and it will get you, it will tell you, it will lead you. And um, so I feel like I'm a believer forever, and I just hope that I will always listen to that voice and do what it asked me to do, and I believe it will. And that's my story. And I'm very happy the way it came, and I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit was able to get through to me. Well, we're Tom and Valerie Cleaver, and this story played out over several weeks and it goes back several years and to us i think it felt less like a god glimpse and more like god was hitting us with the two by four but you can <laughs> see what you think and it all revolves around a prayer shawl that Valerie has right here and and that you love right <laughs> but um we were we had not yet moved to shell point where we live now we lived about an hour away we attended another church the church had a small not real active prayer shawl effort but a good friend of valerie's uh, mm -hmm. as a surprise to her knitted her this shawl which she loves and she sleeps with it and takes it with her whenever she we travel. And uh, one day, uh, about five years ago, we returned from a trip and it was missing. And we looked everywhere, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And we couldn't find it. So a few weeks went by, we called a motel where Val thought she might have left it. They didn't have it. The woman who had made, I decided after a few weeks, I wanted as a surprise to Valerie to get a replacement. And the woman who had knitted it had moved on out of the area. But there was another friend at the church that we knew was involved with knitting, at least at one time. I approached her, good friend, and gave her the background and asked if she might knit or know who might knit a shawl for Val. And the first words out of her mouth, which was very unlike this person, it kind of took me back. First words out of her mouth uh, were, we well, you know nobody ever knitted a prayer shawl for me. And I was just surprised. A, because she'd been involved with that and I thought someone would have. B, it was just unlike her to say something like that. But anyway, she explained she didn't knit anymore. She um, referred us to another friend that she thought, that she knew still knitted and might be able to help us. So I called friend number two. Valerie doesn't know about any of this. The first words out of the mouth of friend number two as near as I can remember, it was even the exact same words. Well, you know, Tom, nobody ever knitted a prayer shawl for me. And I, I was just dumbfounded that that would happen twice. But she went on to say when she finished some other project, she would be glad to do it. And that night, I couldn't even believe it because several weeks had gone by. But that night, Valerie's prayer shawl turned up, didn't it? Found it. It was in the bottom of a carry-on. And of course, I'm trying to process all this, and it didn't take much thought. I mean, it was so obvious to us that for whatever reason, we had been put in charge by God of getting these two, getting prayer shawls for these two friends. 
and we weren't sure how we were going to do it. The effort we realized had kind of disbanded at the church. And I talked to our senior ward, and I remember, did she know anybody at another church? We kind of had a sister church. There was no one there. And it began to look like it just wasn't going to happen. We were in the process of moving to Shell Point, which we did. We came to St. Michael for the first time to check this out. And I'll never forget the first Sunday we were here, the first announcement on the back of the bulletin was about St. Michael's prayer shawl ministry. And it listed Ellie Harry's as the contact. So I called her and explained everything and said, Ellie, is there any chance somebody in your group might be able to knit two shawls for these women? And she said, well, Tom, we have a pretty active group and there's about 30 shawls finished in a cupboard in the office, blessed and ready to go if you and Valerie want to come over and pick a couple out. So we did, Church. and, and um, the priest presented them the shawls. They were very surprised. There were lots of tears. So we have had lots of God glimpses over the years, but never one I don't think as vivid as this one.